Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, the longevity movement, part one of our series on guaranteed lifetime income in retirement. Welcome, everyone, to the first segment, and we're actually entitling our entire series this week, Guaranteed Lifetime Income in Retirement. And the first segment's called the longevity movement. I just want to talk a little bit about the longevity movement because I've chatted about this many times and I've been talking about the mortality revolution at large for almost 25 years. And of course, here's a classic caricature of the Rolling Stones, not back in the day when they were younger, but the way they are now. These guys are in their 60s and 70s. Think about it. These people are children of the 60s and now they're in their 60s. And speaking about the 60s, so when Star Trek came online, there were many, many technological advances in the United States, and a lot of it came from the forethought or the thinking or the imagination of people that were working in sci-fi that now has turned out to be science fact. And the 1960s were full of one, one singular issue that I just find repeating over and over, whether it's in the original Star Trek or the Star Trek Next Generation, and that is human longevity. People are just living longer in the future. Now, of course, that was in the day under sci-fi when they actually said that the actual good Dr. Bones or the Dr. Leonard McCoy, the Admiral, entered the Enterprise D at age 137, according to their scripts. And then, of course, Captain Montgomery Scott entered the, the Enterprise D after being hung up in a transporter accident for 75 years. And he actually walked on the Enterprise D at 147. And then, of course, an alien, a Vulcan, Spock's father, Ambassador Sarek, he actually walked on and died on the Enterprise D at, according to, the, according to the script, at 203 years. I know it all sounds fascinating. When you think about it, what was science fiction is now becoming somewhat science fact. I want to talk a little bit about the antediluvian period. This is before the flood recorded in the book of Genesis. Before the flood, we saw a tremendous human longevity. I mean, look at some of these numbers. Adam, the first human, according to the Bible, 930 years, all the way down to the record-breaking, but I'm sorry, not Guinness Book of World Records. I can't document it outside the sacred script. But Methuselah at 969 years, almost a full thousand-year millennial living. It sounds fantastic. It sounds so out there. Well, we'll see if you think that you think it's that bad after all, because we're going to be going into the future and looking at new mortality horizons, new frontiers in longevity and life expectancy. Genesis 3.6, at the very tail end of this verse, it says, Nevertheless, man's days shall be 120 years. So after the flood, something happened. I don't know it was atmospheric. I don't know if there was some cloud cover or canopy cover. But once the flood came, there seems to be some kind of exposure that led to a decline in human mortality. At least that's what some of the archaeological people think, because we know the event happened. Whether you can tie it to Holy Writ or not, that's another story. Now, at the apex of the Roman Empire, at about 160 AD, Western Europeans' average lifespan was about 25 years. I mean, think about a male living about 25 years. And of course, slavery and militaristic living. I mean, all these things, and, and really the, the rich living rich and everybody else was poor. There was really very little middle class. 25 years is pretty short time to be on the earth. And then when Juan Ponce de Leon was looking for the fountain of youth in the Florida Everglades, he was looking at it about 1513, and during that time period, most Western Europeans were living about an average of 35 years. Then Sir Edmund Haley, you know them as the great scientist and mathematician that discovered the co comet, consequently named after him, Haley's Comet. But what you don't know about it is Sir Edmund took his mathematical skill sets and created the first working actuarial table that looked at life insurance and life annuities back in the day. And fundamentally, we're still using the basic groundwork that he created in the late 1700s and still using that right now, I'm sorry, 1600s, and still using it now. Then we came in, started getting into big issues on longevity and retirement. And the first person to bring this to bear were the pensions that were created today that you know about were actually created in the 1800s by a German named Otto von Bismarck. Otto actually built a whole pension system for people that would be living to age 70. Now, no problem, because the average age at that time in Germany, the actual lifestyle back in the late 1800s was still about 48. So the math worked well. The 1941 CSOs tables are used, what we use for Social Security, kind of pricing it out back in the 40s. The average 
endowment or maturity date for that 1941 CSO table was 62 years. And it was adopted as the payment format. Think about this, an annuity format was actually adopted for Social Security. So it's not that we don't have enough money in Social Security. If people would have just died at 62, we'd have plenty of money. But thinking about people who haven't died on time, the first recipient of Social Security benefits was Ida Mae Fuller. Ida put in a total of $24.75, and her total contributions that she received over her lifetime was $22,888 because she didn't die at 62. She didn't die at 65. She lived to age 100. Unbelievable. You recognize this? So my good friend Willard Scott, he used to be on television. He was a United States weatherman. He was known throughout all of television land. And he used to celebrate people turning 100 every day in America. And he would put them on the Smucker's Jar. It was brought to them by the Smucker's, the jelly people. And every day, if he took the time to say happy birthday to everybody that was turning age 100, it'd take him about 90 minutes a day, 365 days a year to get that job done. And that's all, and that's going to be ever increasing. We just lost Susanna Jones. She was the last tricenturian, the last U.S. tricenturian. There's one more European right now that's still a tricenturian uh, in 1899, and she may become the Guinness Book World Records on tricenturians. Susanna not only was a last tricentenarian, but she also was a, 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 what they call a super centenarian teenager because she actually died at 116 years. And then, of course, the all-time record, documented record of the Guinness Book of World Records, Jean Calmet, 20th century. She lived 122 years, 164 days. She is the Guinness Book of World Records. Who will live till age 100? Well, according to Dr. Aubrey de Grey, somebody's going to, the person that's going to live 150 years has already been born and on the earth today. He also wrote a book called The End of Death. He believes that we're going to be living hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, kind of right, like returning to the format of Genesis. So he looks at this, and if we start looking at math like this, it's just going to underscore everything I'm talking about in this series about lifetime annuities. Now, I'm looking at some of the advancements in medical technology that have changed our mortality, especially over the last 100 years. So when we had smallpox, think about that, being defeated. Think about yellow fever from the Caribbean being defeated. Scarlet fever. When you think about typhoid Mary, diphtheria, you're looking at HIV, leading causes of early death in our late 20th century. Whooping cough, Spanish flu, cholera, the peak of, the, of polio. All these ideas have now been conquered and contained, and it's only extending human mortality. Here's a map of everybody that's living longer. They're very dark blue. I mean, Canada, Europe, Japan are leading the longevity movement. There's some staggering numbers coming up. Right now, we have about 72,000, somewhere around there, uh, people that are age 100 in the United States, and I think worldwide, we're almost at a half a million. Now, what we're going to talk about is the life expectancy in the next section, and what we're doing is, is we're looking at how this impacts the way we think about the longevity movement and about planning. Don't forget to watch our next segment on life expectancy and mortality products, part two of our series on guaranteed lifetime income in retirement. And keep in mind, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, or your financial advisor. You've been watching Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game.